May the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Warren Buffett is an American investor and the seventh wealthiest person in the world. His father was a congressman. So while his story is not exactly rags to riches, in a variety of anecdotes, he shows a keen spirit of entrepreneurship from an early age. Born in Nebraska in 1930, it is said that his first business venture was selling chewing gum, cola bottles, and weekly door-to-door -door magazines. Aged 14, on his first tax return, he had the financial sense to claim back $35 for the use of his bike and watch on his paper round. If you are wondering why he was paying tax on the earnings from a paper round, to give you some idea of the figures, a year later, he was earning $175 a month. That same year, 1945, he and a friend bought a pinball machine for $25 and placed this in the local barber's shop. This was so lucrative that within months, he owned three pinball machines and within the year, he sold the fledgling business to a war veteran for $1,200, 48 times the amount he invested. He bought his first shares aged 11, three for him and three for his sister. He paid $38 per share. The value of the shares dropped to $27, but was soon back up to $40 a share. Spooked, Buffett and his sister sold all their shares. Almost immediately afterwards, it shot back up again beyond to $200 a share. Buffett learned a vital lesson in patience from this. In 1956, he created Buffett Associates Limited with $105,000 from seven people, all friends and family, and only $100 himself. By 1962, it was worth $7.2 million and by 1968, it was worth a total of $104 million, about a thousand times the total amount invested. In 2018, after a lifetime of prudent investing, the aging Buffett uh, was a, had a net worth of $84.5 billion. The life story of Warren Buffett is not unlike the parable told by Jesus in today's readings. In this story, a wealthy man, perhaps the owner of a large farming estate, goes away on business and entrusts his fortune to his slaves. Each slave holds in trust a vast sum of money. One slave manages the equivalent of 1,500,000 pounds the other the equivalent of 600,000 pounds, and the third 300,000 pounds. The first two trade with their trust fund and double the value. The one with 1,500,000 pounds comes out with 3 million pounds, and the one with 600,000 pounds comes away with 1,200,000 pounds, very nearly the amount entrusted to the first slave to begin with. Both are congratulated on the master's return. Well done, good and trustworthy slave. The third slave, however, is entrusted with the equivalent of 300,000 pounds. He decides to bury this in the ground. Something someone did in those days during dangerous times. Yes, he is able to return the fund safely to his master on his return, but he has not grown the trust fund. He receives the master's displeasure, you wicked and lazy slave. What has all this got to do with the Christian life? 
Let's be clear first about what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean, as is often claimed, if you can believe it, that if we give back to God of our money, we can expect a return. When we give money to the church, we cannot expect our pension pots to suddenly perform well, or the value of our house to coincidentally increase, a divine return on our investment. We are encouraged to renew our giving and increase our giving at this time of pandemic, but this passage does not promise anything in return. It may seem laughable to you to think that it might, but you'd be surprised how easily such thinking can creep in. There is nothing in this text that supports it. This is a parable. The talk of money is exactly that, just talk. As we shall see, it stands for something else. Also, slaves in those days couldn't own property. The slaves did not own the return on the investments that they had made. So the idea that if you give back to God, you yourself receive back in return doesn't fit with the text at all. Nor does this parable blame poverty on a lack of faith or laziness for much the same reason. Because the slaves did not own the return on the investment, we are not talking about their personal finances at all. They owned nothing at the start of the parable and they owned nothing at the end. Since the days of the church fathers, rather, this parable has been taken to be about the gifts that we receive from God. In other parts of the Bible, there is a list of what these might include. Being an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher of the faith, or in another part, wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing powers, miracle working, prophecy, the discernment of spirits, speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues. When we reflect on the fact that we are created, we could add to this list every good thing that we receive. As creatures, none of us, even Warren Buffett, are self-made men and women. The prudence or shrewdness that led to Buffett's financial success was in itself a gift from God. We do not own our talents and skills. We did not make these of ourselves. We have been gifted these by God. When we make our money of our intelligence, our intelligence is a gift from God. When we make our money by our people skills, these are a gift from God. When we make our money from our physical strength or the skill of our hands, this is a gift from God. And here we find the good news in today's reading. Slaves in those days were deemed untrustworthy and by law were not allowed to own property, being themselves someone's property. As creatures, we belong to God. As sinners, we can be deemed untrustworthy. And yet in his grace, God has entrusted us, even the least of us with his precious property, and he expects to see a return. What does it mean for God to see a return on the gifts he has given us? We give a return on the investment to the master when we use the good gifts we have been given to the praise and service of God. Did you notice in the parable that even the least slave was entrusted with a fund worth 300,000 pounds? The good things which God trusts us with are so precious to him that even the least of our gifts is so highly valued. That each slave receives a different fund probably does imply that the parable refers to spiritual gifts rather than something which all Christians have, such as the gospel. Whenever the Bible lists the spiritual gifts that Christians receive, there is always the emphasis that everyone receives different gifts and always the emphasis that each gift is supremely valuable. No matter what premium we ourselves place on particular gifts. To the Corinthians who valued speaking in tongues above all other things, St. Paul wrote that just as each part of the body is needed by all the others, so each gifting is needed 
by all the others. St. Paul writes, if the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. This is the logic of our parable today. Did you notice how the first two slaves were entrusted with different amounts and therefore both doubled the investment? They produced different amounts in return. Both still received the same, to enter the joy of the master. God is as pleased with us when we use our gifts to his praise and service, whether our gifts are what we might consider great or modest. It is the intent to serve that counts. We notice how even the least slave was entrusted with a vast sum. To feel that we have been entrusted with only a modest gift is like saying, I have been entrusted with only 300,000 pounds. We need to see the value of the gifts we have been entrusted with. Perhaps people do not make use of their spiritual gifts because they do not value them or compare them to others. To paraphrase St. Paul, do we say, because I am not a, my gifts are not valuable? What do you fill that gap with? Because I am not a minister? Because I am not a preacher? Because I am not a priest? Going back to the text, the third slave gives the reason why he did not make use of what was entrusted to him. He was afraid. He saw his master's grace as wheeler dealing and perceived his master as a harsh man. Indeed, burying treasure was something that people only did as an act of fear. If our relationship with God is based on fear, we can end up with a completely distorted view of him. God's overflowing grace defies our logic. From other parables, the laborer who works an hour is paid the same as the laborer who works five. The son who had squandered his inheritance is celebrated on his return. To those of a certain mindset, perhaps Matthew had the religious leaders in mind. God's grace can look like wheeler dealing. <clears throat> Did not the Pharisees misunderstand Jesus and accuse him of gluttony and drunkenness and of being, as, being unclean for associating with sinners and tax collectors? If our religion is fearful and legalistic, it could distort even our view of grace and the God we slavishly worship through fear becomes a harsh and unpredictable master. It is as though we are looking at God in a mirror, but the mirror is broken into pieces, like the hall of mirrors at a fun fair. What we see as a terrifying grimace, full of teeth and twisted lips, is in fact a smile, beaming with love. If that is how the third slave saw his master, how did the master see his slave? The master saw the slave as lazy. To describe someone as lazy is to say there is no desire to serve. This slave was motivated by security and not service. A twisted, fearful view of the master had taken away all joy in serving and stymied any possibility of growth. And so from a parable which ends with the outer darkness and the weeping and gnashing of teeth, gestures of bitter regret, we actually have the message that a fear-based religion cannot produce the same growth as a faith based on service and love for the God who gives us all good things. <clears throat> what more encouragement can we then have to use the spiritual gifts we have been entrusted with, to recognize the givenness of all that we have and in gratitude to prayerfully and shrewdly use it to the praise and service of the God who gave it for so the parable goes, if in the world of finance, people like Warren Buffett can be so canny with their money, in the world of faith, we can be just as resourceful in the way we use our gifts. We can recognize that the gifts we have been given, though different to others, are of immeasurable value in the service of God. And we could be encouraged that when we serve God, not through fear, or through hope of reward, 
that we will discover a God of love overflowing with mercy and grace. Amen. Amen.